Hi, this is Brian from Let's Code Physics. I sat down with Brad Moser of Physics Alive and Hamilton College and Ann Leake of High Point University to talk about our reflections on the 2022 winter meeting of the American Association of Physics Teachers. In the two hours we spent recording, topics included quantum mechanics, board games, quantum mechanical board games, representation in physics, and what we hope to see in future AAPT meetings. I've split up this conversation into six bite-sized episodes that we hope you'll enjoy. So to jump on to jump on one of the threads that we've been we've been kind of coming back to this the uh, you know the, attending these conferences and what we're getting out of them and uh, th- this was something that that I brought up in our conversation last night and then uh, and then Brian shared this uh, Twitter post that Brian Frank. Uh, had had made. I don't know if that was today or if it was it was yesterday, but it was um, he was showing some of the the numbers that were um, I guess given in the 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 meeting of the members um, a couple of nights ago about how the high school membership has been uh, decreasing and uh, what what that might mean. And there were just a whole lot of replies to that on mm-hmm. on the on the Twitter thread and. Yeah, maybe we, I guess, may spend a few moments here, a few moments, good luck, uh, <laughs> kind of thinking about, you know, what, what, what is for, for us now, we're all coming from the college perspective, the, the, the value of, of the, the membership of, of coming to these meetings and, and how can we, how could we make this a great environment for everybody teaching physics, whatever, whatever level yeah. that, that is. So I don't know a great place to start with that, but, um, the the social aspect, I, I think. Well, actually, okay, I lie. I do know a place to start with that. The social aspect that we're just talking about this this ability to come together, and it's not just about it's not just about these these sessions that we're going to, um, but that it's it's about getting is getting together and having these these spaces where we get to know each other, but where ideas then also come from and and inspiration and new connections. And and just having fun, sort of nerding out the way we physicists can do. Mm-hmm. Um, so that would be something like I would like to take more advantage of in, in the future, and that maybe meetings would focus on that a little bit more. Yeah. Like there's little bits that are done there, but I don't think it's as intentional as as it could be. Yeah, I've I've always found it interesting. We call it a meeting, like we never call it a conference, <laughs> right? The the official mm. name is that it is a meeting. And I mean, it certainly sh- is structured like a conference, right? We have invited sessions, we have contributed sessions, we have posters, we sometimes have panels, like they're starting to experiment with panels. But it, you know, like we were saying earlier, the really exciting stuff is in the hallway where you are rubbing elbows with people. Now, where, where you do need the sessions, I think, is that the sessions help you identify who it is you wanna rub elbows with in the hallway. Right. So Mm -hmm. that when you see uh, Anne's amazing presentation on career options, you know, to go up to her and say, I was I had a conversation with a student about this just last week. And then you dive into that. And that's where you find out all the stuff that they didn't have in their presentation or the stuff they've been working on since they submitted the abstract or got the grant or whatever. Um, And that's where the, you know, ideally that's where the friendships and the collaborations form, or at the very least, that's where you get the energy to go back and do the things that it is that you, that you want to do or that you've learned about at the meeting Um, to, to maybe just summarize some of the conversation uh, that took place on Twitter. um, Brian Frank posed the question of uh, what do you think is the cause of the driver of this? And he framed it as uh, AAPT has transitioned from a membership dominated by K-12 to a membership dominated by higher education. Because like you mentioned, Brad, the majority of the decline is in the high school membership. The, the higher ed membership it looks like it's relatively steady. It's had a little bit of a decline the last couple of years, but what has not declined the last couple of years? I mean, um, but it's there seem to be a few main responses people are giving. Uh, one of the most frequent ones stated is cost and time. That for high school teachers, it's, be, the, it's becoming increasingly cost prohibitive to maintain a membership and pay for dues and carve out the time to go to a meeting. And if you're, I mean, not to downplay everything else that is wonderful that AAPT does, but if you're not going to a meeting, you're probably not motivated to maintain that membership 
you know, just, to, mm-hmm. you know, to, just to get journals and, and, re- and resources, you probably don't have time for anyway. Um, a couple of folks have chimed in and said, well, maybe the issue is that it's two meetings per year and it feels like they can't keep up with that. Or the commitment to be in a leadership position is too high for high school teachers to feasibly keep up with. Um, so committee members are expected to go to, uh, I think it's three out of the four meetings for their two years of membership, or maybe that's the maybe that's specifically the leaders. Um, but anyway, you know that kind of is prohibitive for high school teachers to then be in those leadership positions if they can't get to the the meetings. Um, I, I and a couple of other people brought up the, the notion that one of the reasons you see more from the higher ed folks is that if I'm at a primarily teaching institution, those are tending to ramp up their scholarship research expectations without really providing the search, the, the, excuse me, the, the, without really providing the support for you to do the type of discovery research you were probably trained to do, right? We were, before we started recording, we were talking about people like Anne and myself who transitioned from a discovery research, nuclear condensed matter (laughs) research program into (laughs) physics education. Um, And so it's kind of like, well, I guess I'll go give a talk about the thing I'm doing in my class because that's what I'm spending all my time on. That's what I can actually talk about. And so you can also look at um, authorship in the physics teacher as another indicator that is starting to skew more heavily toward higher ed authors rather than high school authors. I mean, in principle, it's for both of us, but the fact that it's skewing a little bit more toward higher ed is, is a thing to watch. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but it is maybe an indication that the, the high school teachers don't have the motivation to do that the way we do when, when we need that for, for our CVs or for our tenure uh, packets. Um, well, and it could be, it could be yeah. a really good thing too, in a lot of ways, because PER, physics education research, used to be kind of the black sheep of the physics department. And now people are embracing the ideas a lot more. Um, you can actually do research in PER in a physics mm-hmm. department and be supported by your colleagues. And I think with that acceptance, there's also a little more value in PER. Yeah. So the faculty that are like PER adjacent or friends of PER yeah. um, are more willing to explore the application of those ideas. And so you get kind of this increase, not just in the PER community, but in like other faculty who are like, hey, I, there's some benefit in learning, you know, some of these teaching strategies yeah. or things that others are doing in the classroom at other schools that might work for my classroom. Um, you know, so maybe there's some good things kind of happening in the shift, but I do think, you know, one of my friends who was with me as a postdoc, she actually took a teaching position during the pandemic um, and in, in, a, in a high school, teaching high school physics, and then she went to community college. And that year that she was teaching high school, she was busy. Like there was mm-hmm. no way she would have mm-hmm. time to prep a talk go to MBT. The cost, like you said, was really prohibitive. I mean, she still made it because it was online, which is great. (laughs) Yeah. But, but I think her one year stint in there, we just have a whole new respect (laughs) of what physics teachers are, are going through right now, especially, Mm -hmm. you know, the job was hard enough because there's just so few physics teachers in high schools right now and they're overstretched. Um, and I think, you know, it's just getting mm-hmm. thinner and thinner and thinner. The tensile strength of physics teacher. The tensile strength. <laughs> <laughs> so one, Maybe. that that is related to the, the last major sub-thread of that, just to round out the summary here, is uh, people wondering if maybe the high school teachers feel pushed out of AAPT by the growing presence of the PER community. And I certainly, that's not I don't, I don't think anybody in PER is doing that intentionally. Like, like I, I, I wouldn't think that was it. I think maybe that's more of like a, a secondary effect in terms of, I finally, I, I'm a high school teacher. I finally do make it to an AAPT meeting and half the sessions are these graduate students presenting on this one survey they did in their calculus-based freshman level undergraduate course I don't really know what's going on there. So I'm maybe going to go to try to find, you know, something else. So maybe it feels a little bit for uh, a, a little bit uh, alien to them. Um, and so I, I do wonder if maybe this kind of dual 
nature to the meeting is putting a strain on mm. it in the sense of on the one half, yes, there's still stuff for the practicing physics educator, but then there's this other half that, you know, for all intents and purposes, feels like the March meeting for PER. And, you know, the, the PER community needs that, right? They need that environment and they need that type of conference. But I, you know, maybe we need to get back to that original mission of PER exists to serve the physics education world by being in conversation with a teacher. Maybe it's the, it's the connection point between the two halves of the brain that needs some strengthening there. And that, I mean, that's certainly something I try to do in the sessions I organize. I try to always have research side application side. And I try to get those folks, you know, I try to create the opportunity for them to be in conversation with each other. And I think in the summer meeting, we have PERC, you know, there is that opportunity yeah. or sort of the PE mm -hmm. inner space for methodology and things like that. But it is, you know, if more students are coming, they might not also have the skill set to translate their research to teachers for teachers yeah. and working with teachers better yeah. instead of kind of you know, again, it, it really can't be a, they are, you know, PER is doing this just for teachers. It's got to be more of a collaborative space. Mm -hmm. Really, like, you've got to keep the purpose of the conference in mind because we have PERC. It's separate, you know? Yeah. There should be a separate little space, but like, yeah. Yeah, there's some interesting ideas coming up here. And, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, <laughs> I mean, with the growth of, of PER, one would hope that that would mean there would be a bigger contingent from university and college level, and then that the high school numbers would remain steady. Um, the fact yeah. that the college numbers remain steady and high school is dropping maybe means both are actually dropping because you're mm. getting more from PER, but maybe you're not getting as as much. For I, I don't want to, yeah, try to try well, to make it, that up, but it did remind me of this article that actually Brian Frank had written uh, several years ago about the different worlds that you navigate within AAPT. And he came up with this model of four worlds that you might belong to one or you might belong to multiple, right? Okay, what was the word the for the for the bridge that you need? Napata? <laughs> Napatla. Napatla, yeah. So he's he's kind of he's kind of getting to Napatla here, where he said, well, there's the there's the PER world. We've talked about that. There's the university physics educator world who are in principle there for the same reason as the high school physics teachers, but they're talking about, they might be talking about their upper division quantum mechanics course and not the one high school physics course that most people are teaching. There's the high school physics teacher world. And then he lists PIRA slash demo slash apparatus world. Hmm. Um, I would probably today expand because he wrote this in 2018. So this has morphed a little bit. I would probably expand that into the world where you're going to P you're going to AAPT to meet with your AAPT subgroup. Right. So that that hmm. includes me. I when I go to an APT meeting, I'm looking for the pickup people. Like hmm. I'm happy to talk with everybody, but I specifically look for my pickup people and make sure I get time with them because I'm not mm -hmm. going to get to see them in person otherwise. Um, and so I, 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 I'm tempted to, to remind Brian that he wrote this article and posted in reply and say, so do you think this world structure needs to be updated any to, to reflect this? Or maybe what we're seeing is, you know, the, the, a crisis within or between some of these worlds. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder if there's, if if the, the conference needs to be partly more welcoming to folks who haven't found uh, a, a niche yet mm. um because i'm thinking i've i have struggled at the conferences myself i'm not um i'm i can be very outgoing one-on-one -on -one, but i'm not very outgoing in in a bigger group so mm -hmm. i i struggle to kind of like if i'm coming in and i don't know people to to get my way in. So usually I stick with, you know, if I, if I go with a colleague, I'm kind of spending most of my time uh, with, with that colleague. Now I have this, the, the IPLS group that, mm -hmm. that I, I, I talk to. So that, that, that has become my, my subgroup, but I haven't found a way to quite feel as, as maybe welcomed by other people who are already in their other groups who've already figured yeah. out that, that space uh, a little bit better. And, um, yeah, ways that AAPT could help 
help folks. And I guess there's a lot of events that, that, that maybe, maybe that permits it. And I just wasn't as good at taking advantage of those. Um, I'm not sure what your thoughts are. One thing that I really like, um, NARST is a little harder to enter, I think, than AAPT, partly because it's bigger. NARST is the, the science education, big conference that happens every year, and it's mostly research focused, but um, it's very, it feels very difficult to enter that. But one thing that they set up there that I really like is this mentoring program. So um, if you're, mm-hmm. you sign up for the conference, you can select to either be a mentor or um, have a mentor as part of your conference experience. And then they have in one of the, you know, the first sessions, they have a mentor meetup and mm-hmm. it's like a big room, you go and find your mentor. Um, and then they kind of just introduce you to people who are in the room <laughs> and like walk you around, yeah. help you figure out sessions to go to. And it's fairly informal, but I think having that one person that you're like assigned to connect with, Mm -hmm. um, it it really does help with that bigger conference feel and maybe something that AAPT could try. I don't know. Yeah, just almost like a shadowing or a a conference Mm -hmm. guide buddy. I I did something similar with my um, research students that I took to the virtual summer meeting this past summer. Um, because they, they they were all presenting, they were all nervous. They had no idea how to choose a session to go to, what what to get out of a presentation. I said, okay, let's sit down. I will give you a conference orientation, and I walked <laughs> them through how do I make a schedule for for what I'm going to go to. How do I tell whether how, how do I listen to a talk, right? Because you don't listen to every slide equally, right? Mm-hmm. You 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 get the intro you muddle your way through the methods and you let, and you look for the, the money slide at the end where they they're showing the thing that they did. But what I also did was I ran them, I, I ran through them, or I ran through with them this communities model of what are the circles you're going to be seeing and who is in them. And so I, I, I shared with them some names and I said, look, if you see this person in a session, that means you are entering this world, they are probably going to talk about this thing, which you read about in this article by that person, you know, and I kind of walk them through, here are kind of the main pickup people, here are the main uh, uh, PER people who are working on this, here are the main PER people who are working on this, here is a, a, a couple of big name high school teacher people, and so I kind of gave them the guide of you know, these are the things that they will probably be talking about. If you're interested in this thing, this is the person you want to go and find. And I, and I really encourage them, go talk to anyone you want to. They will be happy to talk to you. It's, it's only the <laughs> nicest people who actually come to this meeting. And anybody is happy to talk to you about whatever you, you want, you know, based on their, their talk or, or the session you're just in or whatever. And I, I, I don't know how many of them follow that advice in detail, but I think it kind of lowered the pressure for them a bit to feel like, okay, this is actually a space I can be in and navigate and benefit from. They've got the map of the high school lunchroom now. They can figure out where they- Yes, (laughs) yes. I don't know how to do that at scale, but it would certainly be great to figure out how. (laughs) All right, I'm thinking maybe we should move on to our our last reflection here, which is- Sure. What- takeaway are you most interested in putting to action Mm. i'll I'll, i can jump in first yeah and (laughs) and i think it's because i've i've been already thinking about this a little bit um with the uh with the get the facts out which Mm -hmm. which brian you'd brought up um attending that session uh earlier and it's it's a piece that i i've looked at some of the resources I've, i've signed up for their um, for their, their newsletter and, and information. So I, I've been, so they've been sort of on my, on my radar. And like, finally, after listening to this, I thought, you know, I, I really need to, I really need to start putting some of this information up, uh, within my department, because we have a very robust physics major, you know, we're graduating maybe 20 majors a year right now with an undergraduate population of only about 2000. So it's a very, uh, it's a very strong department, but almost nobody goes off into teaching. Uh, there's mm-hmm. there's a couple here and there. There really isn't a whole lot of, of emphasis on it. So I feel like I'm in a position where you know I'm non tenure track. I'm I'm more interested in the in the straight up teaching side of things. So this this could be my role to play 
where I can encourage folks and, and say, hey, have you thought about that as a, as a possible career choice? Um, and just just get the, the figures into their hand to think about that to, if they're interested. So I think that's the one that I, I think I'm most ready to be able to, to act on right now. I like it. That would be good. I wish I had seen that talk. It sounds really motivating too, like for just recruitment of teachers. And I, I want to go be a high school teacher again. Maybe not in a, in they a boarding school. They did a good job time. then. Yeah. They're recruiting <laughs> even you. Um, I guess I can share mine if you want. Um, go for it. So, so it's it's actually kind of similar. I think getting the facts out, you know, can also help with uh, retention and attrition in programs. Is mm-hmm. like know what what the current statistics are in order to make changes not just assume um where we are and angela johnson is working on a portal with a lot of uh, retention and attrition data and it's broken down by different areas different types of universities and you can play in the portal with with the different data um and it's very easy to visualize uh so it's kind of like it's it's you know a aip data but that you can mess with. Um, and so I'm excited her portal. She, she said, it'll be out. I mean, it's a whole team. The, the talk was amazing. Mm -hmm. Um, but I guess the portal's coming out hopefully next month. Um, and I'm just excited to see where we are. I mean, a lot of times we, we find data and it's very fixed in one point in time from a while ago. And I keep making decisions based on that. (laughs) So it'll be nice to better help students and think about future career paths and make decisions if, if we have the facts. I like it. Mm-hmm. We, get, we can do that yeah, for teachers. Great. We can do that for undergraduates. Yeah. So we talked about the uh, proliferation of quantum topics. I, I One of my talks was also about quantum education stuff because I'm uh, my colleague and I from, uh, from our Department of Education, uh, we have a grant to train high school teachers to deploy some quantum content through computational activities. Uh, And I've kind of, I've kind of developed the materials as best I can on my own and kind of exhausted my thought process of, well, here's what I would have them do. Here's what I would recommend, et cetera. And so seeing the wealth of information coming out from from folks here, I've got stuff to kind of comb through and go through. One of the big items is um, uh, one of the presenters, uh, Mark Hannum, who is on staff with AAPT, uh, uh, had a presentation on similar initiative and he's actually coming to our group meeting uh, Mm -hmm. next week uh, so that we can kind of share data talk about what our teachers are learning, maybe share some materials, et cetera. And so I'm, we're currently in kind of version 2.0 of, well, we haven't quite started it yet. So we're in version 1.9 of our materials. And so I think with this, I could probably push it out to version 2.5 or 3.0 or something. Um, So that'll be, that'll be really interesting to, to get to expand on. Also, I will order a quantum party because it looks amazing. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Nice. You've got to talk to Daniel Harlow's group too. They're doing some really fun hands-on activity. Hands Daniel on. Harlow, okay. Yeah, Thank at UC you. Santa Barbara. They've got this whole um, quantum for, for kids project. And I feel like it could work for high school too. I mean, they're just really engaging activities. Yeah, I mean, it, anything you come up with for elementary, awesome. you can use all the way up to senior level undergraduate because yeah. it, 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 it's conceptual. It, it's and conceptual, it reinforces. Accessible. It helps, it helps introduce the concepts, or you can say, where do you see this highly technical concept at play here? <laughs> and it's, it's just a way for them to unlearn it and kind of deprogram all the jargon that they've learned, which yeah. is really important. Well, this has been a very fun conversation. I've yes. appreciated this. Uh, and thank you so much for joining Brian and I this evening. We uh, should, we, so should all three, me. No. <laughs> we should all three do this again. That was fun. Yeah. <laughs> Anytime. This is great. Thank you so much.